And I would like to call for stage, I would like to call for stage Professor Fonagy. So just to introduce Dr. Shor and Mr. Broshi. Dr. Shor, he's a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. I, I can hear myself. I, it's difficult for me to hear myself. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I can hear myself. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Fine. So, uh, Dr. Shaw, he's a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. He's a, the director of the outpatient clinic at Yehuda Barbanel Mental Health Center in Batyam. Dr. Shaw is a member of the Israeli Psychoanalytic Society. He's a lecturer in the Tel Aviv University School Psychotherapy Program and teacher in the Israeli Psychoanalysis Institute. Uh, Jerusalem member of the Natal, the Israeli Trauma Center for Victims of Terror and War. And also, he's got a private practice. And Mr. Yoav Broshi, who is my good friend, very good friend, and partner and co-director at the Israeli Center for Mentalizing. He's a teacher at the psychoanalytic psychotherapy program at uh, Tel Aviv University and a teacher at the Magid Institute and also a teacher in the new, new school for psychotherapy in uh, Tel Aviv. Okay. Yes, uh, let's begin. Uh, shalom lekulam. This is a rare opportunity, uh, Professor Fonegi, to have this uh, conversation as short as it is. Uh, to try to tie some of the theoretical uh, concepts that you were elaborating uh, this uh, wonderful morning and uh, the role play that we were just uh, witnessing, I would like to start, uh, if you please, with a personal uh, question. How was it for you? Or more particularly, uh, could you point out in, uh, from your own uh, impression what was the moment or the particular intervention that you, that you felt that was effective uh, with, uh, with Ruti? If you can um, focus on that. You asked like three questions there. Uh, if I can uh, uh, answer uh, the first one, um, it's... And I'm not going to talk about what it's like doing a role play because it's not very interesting. But um, the, um, when a patient comes in where you feel guilt about whether it's right or wrong, whether you've you know, really let them down or you didn't leave, let, you didn't or you did, but you feel guilty because um, uh, inevitably you haven't done as much as they need. Uh, it's a, a, a bad situation from their point of view. Um, and, uh, so, subjectively, you are confronted with all inadequacy of, uh, inadequacy of uh, uh, what you have to offer. Uh, it's, you know, you feel, you know, that, oh, yeah, but you're right, really. I mean, you know, what is it that I'm offering? You know, it's not, not that much, you know, and I can't really see you all the time, and you want to be seen all the time, and you want me to kiss your cuts better, and, you know, I'm not going to do that. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's really difficult. So it gets you, and, and that uh, makes thinking, mentalizing difficult for you and difficult to get into the groove of where you want to be. Um, and... Uh, uh, so that's just to this kind of subjective thing. Uh, what helps ultimately is, um, I think, to get the situation, uh, uh, the arousal reduced so that you can actually start thinking. Um, uh, and um, uh, both of you start thinking. And if you can, the more you can achieve a sense of collaboration, between you and uh, the patient, uh, the more effective it is. So um, with Ruth, uh, uh, 
brilliantly acted, I will say, brilliantly acted. Uh, Dear, dear. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, uh, with Ruth, um, the, you know, being able to get her uh, to see that there was a real difficulty, that her needs, legitimate though as they were, um, could not possibly be met. But that created a problem for us because how are we going to be able to work together? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, she, what she felt, what she was, you know, what was most important for her about the relationship, that it wasn't enough. But then there wasn't a relationship. So we had, we had a problem there. Yeah. And that as long as we were able to uh, address that. Now, I didn't have time to do a proper risk assessment. I was quite concerned uh, about um, and I don't know whether it was the act or, or reality, but I was really quite concerned about uh, Ruth's agitation. Mm -hmm. She was quite agitated. And uh, uh, I, even when I felt we'd kind of got her a little bit closer to uh, being, uh, the, the, the kind of the uh, um, arousal being less the dominant theme, even then she was quite, uh, and I was, that's why I thought that when I had a few minutes left at the end of the session, we should go uh, through uh, some kind of crisis plan that we had before, which we would have had. Uh, but there would have been something that we would have co-designed between Ruth and I as to what we're going to do when there's a crisis. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that, 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 that's, uh, that's trying to answer a question. Henry, please join in. Uh, okay, so much for being here and I think I imagine that many people have different interests in, when talking with you and uh, so I want to kind of uh, disclose it that I would like to talk to you from, the, from my identity as a psychoanalyst and what is uh, bothering me is, and uh, for a couple of years I have been uh, dealing or meeting uh, mentalization approaches and for me, it's uh, very important to understand what is actually the development in psychoanalysis. Uh, what is specific about mentalization which still keeps it within the, the common ground of psychoanalysis? And what is the specificity of making it different? Because um, when I listened to the way you, you worked with Root, basically for me, I in a way started to discover also yesterday evening when I prepared it that actually all the post-Freudian approaches deal with mentalization. Beyond that's his main issue, <laughs> Winnicott. Um, but I think that something about the technique is different. So there is a common ground, but I would like you, if you can talk a little bit more uh, what does it mean for you that you come from the psychoanalytic tradition? What has changed for you? And how much do we deal with this um, discontinuous continuity within psychoanalysis? Um, it's, I mean, I, in my younger years, when I was uh, uh, younger, I, I, I remember giving papers in psychoanalytic institutes, and um, I remember the kind of the stage whisper, you know, uh, in the audience saying, so, "Well, it's maybe interesting, but it's not psychoanalysis." Um, so um, I think you know it's even worse when when a psychoanalyst develops. So they sometimes say, "This is no longer Melzer." Yeah, oh God. Melzer is no longer Melzer. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, so, you know, my, um, if I said but that what I was doing has nothing to do with psychoanalysis, it would be blatantly false. It would just be a lie. Um, I'm a psychoanalyst. I think that psychoanalysis offers the best model of uh, psychology that uh, I have, and that's the one I use when I try and understand or mentalize in relation to people. So, uh, as you said, Winnicott, Bion, uh, particularly, um, and a lot of people who are uh, followers of Bion think that we have stolen, quote, 
uh, our ideas from beyond. Quite possible. I don't think that anything that we are doing is original. Mentalizing has been there since human beings uh, uh, became human beings since you know we uh, came out of Africa. Mm. Uh, so you know, all that we are, I'm trying to do in relation to psychoanalysis is um, personally uh, is um, try and uh, use my psychoanalytic understanding of the person, apply that in the context of enhancing their capacity to think, to represent thoughts, feelings, wishes, beliefs, and desires. But this is the primary challenge that they have. Now, I don't think it's so relevant in situations where that's not the primary challenge. I don't think that in treating depression, for example, it's an important thing. It's important sometimes when a person with depression loses their capacity to mentalize, then you kind of get this box of tricks, uh, how to re help re a person recover mentalizing in, 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 into the uh, um, therapeutic, into a consulting room. On the other hand, um, uh, I think mentalizing per se uh, is not, although in our model of it, it's rooted in psychoanalysis. A lot of other people claim it as well. So when we do trainings, and there are uh, people who have a systemic training there, they say, well, what you're doing is systemic psychotherapy. You know, this is systemic family therapy. This is not psychoanalysis. It's nothing to do with psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. And when we have, I, I've even had uh, people from uh, DBT saying, well, look, it's just validation. You know, it's just, it's just it's DBT, really. It's just not, my feeling about that is fine. Mm -hmm. Just do more of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are also already 1,246 different schools of psychotherapy. It really doesn't need one more. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's not, it's, it's, I'm, I can't get excited about that question. But I, when you say that it's a different technique, I couldn't agree with you more. Mm -hmm. But there are many more psychoanalytic techniques than we normally admit. Mm -hmm. And we often don't talk about that because we are trying to find a common identity in terms of our theories, rather than, you know, people too Kleinians, or too Winnicottians, or too uh, Maltzerians, may be doing something very, very different in the city. Mm -hmm. Even too Lacanian uh, psychologists may be doing very Especially. different things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> There may be many Lacanians in the audience. You do, yeah, I've learned never to offend anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't so maybe uh, we can expand the Henry's uh, question to what we were just uh, seeing here on the stage. Uh, because uh, you were talking in the morning about the therapist's stance. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking uh, the theme of this uh, conference is borderline personality. And we sometimes uh, tend to forget that mentalization and pre-mentalized pre uh, uh, states is something that happens to all of us, and particularly to uh, therapists when they are encountering their patients. Uh, so I think it's a general question, which is not just limited to this situation, how to regulate your own mentalization, and especially in the clinic room. And I want to tie to you to what we were just seeing. Um, maybe you can uh, tell us how do you do that, that uh, you don't fall into uh, psychic equivalence or you get out of it or pretend more with it, which is, I think, something which more often happens in my, uh, in my own experience and I find it very important as uh, one of the major ideas of MBT. Uh, I mean, you know, I, d I think we all have our different ways. Um, I trend, my... my uh, uh, my metaphor for it is that as long as I can feel, if I no longer feel that I'm sitting side by side with the patient, looking, in the, you know, looking at the problem, that we are kind of working together on something out there, but I'm kind of working at the patient rather than in collaboration with them, I know that I'm at fault. I've lost mentalizing. Mm -hmm. I could haul myself back. I have to say, I'm sorry. I'm kind of, obviously I lost um, 
I've lost where you are properly. Help me. Uh -huh. You know, you need to help me. I, I, I'm not, maybe I'm having a bad day or whatever, but I really, I don't think I really appreciated what you've been trying to say. So to me, what helps and reduces my anxiety is if I don't have to feel responsible, I, I see it as a joint collaborative task that we need to go uh, together to a place where the patient doesn't necessarily want to go to, uh, but as long as we go together, that's fine. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's my anxiety. And on the way you are modeling to the patient something about your own mind that you can lose or not know or show the gap between you and the patient. Uh, um, yeah, as, that's as, absolutely as empathic, right. As an yeah. empathic, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, move. That's absolutely right. I'm modeling it, but actually what I'm also doing, which is the more embarrassing part of it, I'm asking the patient to model my mind because I lost it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's trying to make use of the patient, trying to call the, pull the patient back in. Look, help me here uh, because um, uh, I'm not sure that I am really in that balance along, you know, in the middle, mm -hmm. the midline, and maybe I'm swinging one way or another on one of those dimensions, and I need your help in doing so. To me, the collaboration with the patient is uh, the critical thing that will get me back. Yeah. So I, I would also like to continue from there because I think we are now getting um, to explore what are the differences in technique and not so much what are the differences in theory. So when it comes to technique, what struck me is this, that it seems to be a different relationship between talking and listening than, let's say, in traditional psychoanalysis, even when it's post-Freudian, the listening, I think, is more stressed than to approach the patient. So I felt that the relation, the, the actual relationship was much more dense in the form of a dialogue. And uh, I would like to ask you if this is perhaps uh, a right characterization of what is specific about mentalization versus, let's say, beyond with reverie and alpha function, you know, a, something that is more oriented to listening. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, this is something that, um, it's a very good question. I really appreciate you asking that. If, and it does have a theoretical answer, if the person that you're sitting with does not have a capacity for self-reflection, leaving them to ponder, to try and reflect with a machine that doesn't work is like, um, you know, basically it, it's potentially harmful. It, it, it's, it'll make things worse. It's like having a, if you've got a, a, a gearbox that's not working well, you know, crunching it is not going to help you. Um, so um, the activity, the, act, the level of activity, uh, the way I sometimes uh, describe it to myself and others is that in, in, when I do therapy with someone who's more what used to be called the neurotic spectrum, uh, the not the severe personality disorder spectrum. I can sit back. I can I can listen. When I'm doing therapy with someone who is in that deep state, I have to sit forward. I have to kind of sit at the edge of my chair, and you know, not as it were, ready to leap, but <laughs> ready, ready to see, to be seen, to be engaged. Because if I sit back what it'll leave them feeling is that they're completely on their own. And actually, Ruth was, was very good at acting that. You know, she described, I thought, uh, beautifully um, uh, the loneliness, the isolation that someone feels when they are unable to be in touch in any other way except via sex or physical touching or or something, it, you know, it leaves them with a sense of uncertainty, a sense of isolation, an unbelievable uh, uh, emptiness inside. And that's really what, in terms of the implicit 
the technique, what it's aiming at, is to be right there, as it were, adversity, is that they lose out on this communication because whereas we're all also, whilst wanting to learn from others, we're also a little bit vigilant about, li about believing what other people say to us and appropriately vigilant mm -hmm. because they could be not acting in our best interest. When you have someone who has had at some fairly adverse experiences or maybe genetically uh, is disposed that way, they get into a state of epistemic hypervigilance when they trust nobody. And then what you saw uh, with uh, uh, Ruth was someone who really couldn't change, wasn't able to change because she didn't believe anything anyone told her. So that she didn't really believe her experience of me as caring unless she was in the room with me. Mm -hmm. She was no way that she could. So she had, she was in a state of epistemic mistrust. Mm -hmm. Nothing that I could say in that state she would take seriously okay. unless I established the trust. You know, I, I, but I wanted to, to comment on this point because I don't know how you felt, but I felt that Ruth, as she was presented by the actors, she was um, not one of the most difficult patients that I can recollect. Okay, but you do it then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I tell you, I tell you what, 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 I, what, what I mean is, because she was um, all the time returning that you disappointed her. Yeah. But she could say it. Uh, I'm thinking of patients with whom you get into an impasse. Let's say they become silent. They, oh, yeah. they don't talk to you anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think that all good analysts are more active than Freud could allow himself to be. But it depends where the activity is located. So I think, for example, that Bion was very, very active in his mind. And I think you are very active on the um, relational basis. And I think it makes, it makes a difference. And I think that with patients, who disrupt the communication when you get with them into an impasse. But the big question is, do we get into an impasse because we work with them? Is it a yatrogenic effect of a, of a specific technique? So mm -hmm. You said it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm asking you. <laughs> I, I think that's what you think. I, I mean, I... I, I <laughs> mm -hmm. You can read minds. <laughs> you must be a psychoanalyst. <laughs> uh, uh, I, 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 you know, my, my feeling is uh, very strongly that um, uh, I, I've had patients as, with my active technique who stop talking. Mm -hmm. uh, but my feeling is that it's really it's the most important time for us to start thinking, what have I done wrong? Mm -hmm. And that you really, at that point, you, you start, as it were, a self-analysis, maybe with the room, look, say, look, you've got a problem here. At the moment, you can't talk to me, and I'm suffering from that. It's really upsetting me that, you, that we are sitting here and you can't talk to me. I don't know how to solve that problem. Can you help me? Because I'm really miserable. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, so that's, again, this, let's sit side by side. Let's, you've got a problem. You've got a dumb therapist and a dumb patient. Mm -hmm. You know, let's, let's try and sort that out. And, and let's get in there. And, 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 and rather than me sitting, well, look, so, isn't so, it interesting? So, so you're kind of more directly, <laughs> directly approaching You were not to say, this is interesting now, yes. Yeah, Peter, I think you're trying to say something very important about the regulation, our own regulation of, a, of our feelings, but also of the working alliance. And some three years ago, you were writing in an article in 2010, it's a mystery why working alliance is so important. Now I think you, you feel that you have the answer for that. Oh. <laughs> one answer. One answer, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, what I do believe is that uh, um, trust has to be won. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the trust that a person has in another person in terms of believing what they say sufficiently to take it beyond that situation and to generalize it to the rest of their life is an enormous gift that 
therapy sometimes get and sometimes not. We can all make our patients behave differently whilst we are with them in the room. Mm -hmm. The big, big uh, achievement is when that is something that they're able to take uh, outside. Between, stage, be between, between sessions, sessions and after keep they are gone. So you would say that personality disorder is actually the, the breakdown or the inaccessibility to cultural communication. This is your term. I mean, that's, yeah, exactly. That, that, that's, it's, it's a kind of social, it's an it's a so, inaccessibility to social communication, an inaccessibility to change and influence uh, from other people. Thank you very much. Henry, would you like to say something final? Yeah, um, you know, also to continue this, because what I was lacking, and uh, I think that for me, I think in psychoanalysis it is central, what is actually the development of this incapacity? I think you mentioned this, um, the, the failure of the mother to mirror. How, how, do, how does it happen? How, how does it happen? Because I think that, um, that usually we try to, to to develop the treatment out of an understanding of the interior working of the mind and what went actually, what went, what went actually wrong. So, um, so in a way, what I feel is that, and I think every most of us would agree that in in personality disorder you have an ego deformation or you have an ego breakdown, or an, uh, or what Canberra called. Uh, kind of uh, a general uh, failure of the ego or weakness of the ego. And I think that you are addressing very often the ego directly. But this is exactly the, the, the question. Does it really strengthen the ego in the long run? You know, besides the empirical evidence that you have. Because it, it's like ego training in a way. I also go to the gym. Hmm? I mean, the, the, the training is not a bad thing. No, no. <laughs> uh, but I mean, you know, it's not, it's not a, you know, we're not working on conflict in terms of resolving conflict. We or work on conflict, yeah. We work for, to enhance the capacity to deal with conflict. So if you represent conflicts as mental, as opposed to in the physical realm, it's easy, they're easier to deal with and you live as opposed to cut yourself or not. I think, to me, what I feel passionate about is less knowing how the person got there is really being able to help that person to go to the next phase of their life. Mm -hmm. And that's really looking to the future and establishing a continuity of that person going forward is, is, is the most important thing. Thank you very much. I'm sure you will evolve, develop. Thank you very much again. Thanks very much for the interesting and uh, stimulating dis discussion. I thought that uh, observing these three people discussing uh, such serious matters, uh, all of them were in a kind of marketness state, state being serious yet being playful and joyful, uh, looking and, and, and conversing, discussing the issue. And I think that uh, after this short discussion, uh, uh, we, should, we should change our topic to not to what works for borderline personality disorders, but what works for the therapist for borderline personality disorder. Uh, which brings us, brings us to, the, to the next session, which will be the panel uh, discussion with all presenters. I, I would like to, to call for stage, uh, yes, Professor Frosetti, Dr. Silk, and Dr. Yermans. So I, I will start for, with the first question for, for discussion along the lines of what works for us therapists, clinicians, working with such difficult patients. Uh, from my understanding of the presentation that you, you, you gave, each of us or each of you hold to a certain stance, which is a fundamental kind of stance for you as a therapist in the room. Uh, it's my idea, but can you agree with it or not? I don't know that's part of it. But for, as I understand, for, for DBT, it's the, the, the fundamental state of being in, a, in dialectics. Right. And in, the, in the MBT, it's the not knowing stance. And in the, in the TFP model, it is uh, being neutral and being active. Mm -hmm. Now, can you 
please elaborate on the commonalities and differences in these three fundamental stances, uh, whether they are common or, or different in a way? Both. <laughs> You mean that it wasn't so a good question? I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, it was and it wasn't. No, of course it. Is. Of course, it's a good question. I, 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 I'm happy to start, but I, I, I can't uh, immerse myself into uh, these other two models very well. I, I understand them just superficially. Um, from a dialectical perspective, from a DBT perspective. The stance is one of uh, trying to very seriously and, and comprehensively develop empathy and compassion for the person and his or her suffering on the one hand, and on the other hand, not get stuck in that suffering. Um, and at the same time, we have compassion and understanding and validation. Uh, we also say, at the same time, the most compassionate thing we can do for someone who's suffering is help them get out of that suffering. So we simultaneously want to enter into the world of their suffering and help them get out of the world of suffering. And so that's the stance. And of course, in order to do that, we have to, we have, to have the capacity ourselves to tolerate the patient's suffering and also be able to think and, and, and have that experience at the same time. Because if we get too overwhelmed with that suffering, we can't think very well. If we can't think, we can't problem solve and, and figure out how to help the person out of that suffering. So, so those are some of the, the tensions, the dialectical tensions that are there. And of course, there, there are many more of them. Passing the mic. Listen, I've been talking all night. That is true. You expect me to empathize? Give a little bit of. I'll try to find it. Anyway, uh, we go back a long time. So I think it's a wonderful question, and I'll try to emphasize perhaps the differences because, in my experience with these panels, people emphasize what's overlapping because they're a little tired and don't want to get into debates, perhaps, or because they're very nice and don't want to get into arguments. I think there's a lot we do in common. And I think everything contributes, of course. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be here. So part of what these meetings do, and again, we have to thank Perry uh, and everyone else here at the Margaret Institute who organizes. Um, I always learn from my colleagues. But again, to get to what's different, let me tell you a little bit more about our concept of neutrality. And it's, a, it's an unusual one, I think, because as I said yesterday, it's a neutrality not from the start. At the beginning, when we set up our frame of treatment, we're on the side of what we consider a healthy life. And sometimes there are very destructive forces in our patients. So somebody who I would say might be radically neutral would take a patient who comes in and says, you know, I've really got this conflict. I want to kill myself and I haven't managed to do it. Radically neutral stance would be, well, let's resolve your conflict. It's all the same to me if you choose the side of killing yourself or if you choose this. Now, that would be radical neutrality. We're on the side of a healthy life. But once we set up the frame of treatment, which includes goals that are mutually agreed upon and so on and so forth, then we take a more neutral stance because we want to get to know every particular element or persona that populates the patient's internal world. And our hypothesis and clinical experience is that some of these personae are unknown to the person. They are not consciously in that person's awareness, but they're acted out or they're evoked in us in our counter-transference. So here's the comment that um, might be a little provocative. And it is different from what Peter is doing with Ruth. Um, I think when we see a patient respond in a particular way, we, and this comes straight from Otto Kernberg, and I have to tell you what he told us initially in our supervision group. If you want to figure out what element comes from the patient's unconscious, what they're not aware of, say, or what, putting it slightly different, what reflects the character issue, the personality trait that needs help? Say to yourself, or ask yourself, what is it 
in this person's response right now, in this person's reaction to the situation with you right now, that's different from what a normal person would do. And we all said, no, Otto, that, that, that's just so old fashioned and not to mention unpolitically correct. We all know there is no normal now. So Otto said, all right, forget about normal. Ask yourself, what is the patient doing that would be different from what you would do in that situation? And then we all said, oh, well, yeah, we, we can figure that out. So <laughs> then we would get to situations such as how we deal with empathic failures on the part of the therapist. And as I believe I said in an example yesterday, when the Australian therapist uh, kept her patient waiting five minutes and the patient was extremely angry and accusing the therapist of having injured her terribly, after what the therapist thought was an adequate apology, the therapist said to herself, thinking, you know, I've got to monitor my countertransference, and not become an element of the patient's internal world, which is somebody who would be just endlessly apologizing for being hopelessly abusive, something I think corresponds to Peter's concept of the alien self. The therapist just said, okay, I've responded within a real context, the context of what might be expected in normal social reality. Let's analyze the rest as being part of the patient's internal world. So I think we're less willing to take responsibility for empathic failures, quicker to look at what's going on in the patient's mind that leads them to the extreme reaction. And I'll just finish with our concept of empathy, which I think may be a little bit different, because usually uh, empathy is conceptualized as being in touch with the patient's experience of the moment. We consider that one element of empathy, but our concept of empathy is to be in touch with what the patient is in touch with and also what is in them that they are not in touch with yet. So to give you an example, I'm sorry if I'm going on too long, but to talk about projective identification, a concept that's quite compelling when, when you're experiencing it as a therapist and which is one of the reasons we all need supervision groups because sometimes it overwhelms us. I was sitting with a patient who, without going into the details, found the way to belittle and demean me more than has ever happened before, I think, in a session. So as I was listening very attentively, without my being aware of it, I began, I, all of a sudden I noticed that within my head there was an image of strangling the patient, the fantasy. And I said, you know, I, first I noticed it, and then I said, you know, this isn't part of my usual response to patients. So I think it's his stuff and not mine. And at that point, I interrupted the process because sometimes we find the free associative process can, can be used defensively. You have to interrupt it sometimes. I said, you know, whatever else we talk about in this therapy, I think we should wonder about the feeling of hate. And he could run with it. He could take it and go with it. It was a turning point in therapy. So I would say the empathy there was not just what was what he was feeling, but what he was getting me to feel that he couldn't feel himself. Ready now, Peter? I, I feel um, that uh, I've tried to answer uh, Ilan's question in a number of ways. I'm now kind of trying to respond to what you two guys uh, uh, have said. I mean, what Alan is saying, which is uh, in, in some ways quite exciting, uh, is um, uh, more on the lumping side, and you are more on the splitting side, if I may say. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get it? Spitting? <laughs> Got it. <laughs> okay. That's a good idea. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, um, no, I mean, I, I don't disagree uh, with either of you because I'm constitutionally incapable of disagreeing <laughs> with anyone. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm one of the people that uh, uh, Frank was referring to earlier, you know, who just wants well, these panel discussions all to just do very well and for everybody to be very happy at the end and to all have tea together. 
Uh, but there is a really serious issue, and this is what actually, this I genuinely think this. We all of us sitting around this table have our bags of tricks, bags of tricks that we were trained in, we were supervised in uh, by uh, a woman or by, by a man. Uh, we all have this supervision, and uh, 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 we have acquired a bag of tricks, some of which we then added to it from our own experience. And as experienced therapists, we have a, a large number of things that we tend to do. Actually, we forgot some of the things that we were taught uh, and some of the things that we've seen we don't do, but we just do a bag, we have a bag of tricks. Now, the question to me, the real question is, what, do those, what does that achieve for the patient? How do we conceptualize that? Um, and is what it's achieving for the patient actually happening in the room or outside the room? I'm increasingly convinced that actually the real progress happens because we prepare in our different ways our patients to live outside the room uh, with others in a better way. So in that sense, um, uh, it becomes, uh, that the issue becomes an order of magnitude more complicated because what determines the outcome of therapy is perhaps as much the social context that our patients live in as what we do in the room because we can open up a patient to a social context that is actually pretty horrific and there's nothing that we can do in the room that will change that. Uh, so you know, my, my emphasis would be we all have wisdom of various kinds. We impart that wisdom and that wisdom achieves for us, buys us enough trust that our patients have enough trust in us to go to the outside world to try it in a different way and to learn in their social world in a more mature or more closer favoring life sort of way. Uh, but if their world is such that it favors death over life, there is, I think, and this is where maybe the mentalization based approach kind of, of humbleness uh, can come in, that I have to be humble, that there's very little, I can help people recover mentalizing. But if what that achieves for them is to see more clearly the helpless and hopeless situation that they are in in terms of their relationships with people and the adversities that they still face and that I can, I'm helpless in relation to. Uh, it's, you know, I have to accept that uh, that box of tricks has just not done all that it could. I don't know whether you agree with that. Oh, I would agree fully. Just, and then, then speaking to the mic. I agree fully. Yeah, I want that recorded. <laughs> but in response to what Peter just said, I'd be interested in Alan's comment. One of the things about traditional psychoanalysis, I must say, it's unfortunate traditional psychoanalysis can so easily be parodied. So let's leave that to the side because it's evolved a great deal, as we all know. But in any case, um, often early analysts didn't pay enough attention to the patient's outside life. And we're very much cognizant of the fact you need to know what's going on in the session and always be aware of going in uh, with what's going on in the patient's external reality. But I want to talk about just an experience we had in New York when a um, psychologist researcher who had spent six months observing a DBT supervision group came to observe our TFP supervision group. And he, oh, I'm sorry. So yeah, the psychologist had been observing a DBT supervision group for six months and then came to observe our TFP one. And he made an interesting observation, but it has to do with the outside situation of the patient versus what's going on in the therapy. Let me preface this by saying there's a lot of talk about therapeutic alliance. And the therapeutic alliance measures that exist are all about do you feel good, do you feel better, do you like your therapist, and so on and so forth. We consider that a bit superficial. For us, a good therapeutic alliance is if the patient ends the session saying something like, I can't stand you, I never want to see you again, I hate your guts, and knows that they're safe to come back to the next session, they're welcome to the next session, you accept them for all they are, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So in any case, sometimes we're seen as provoking negative emotion, and Peter would say we arouse, ar ar we stimulate, stimulate, stimulate the attachment system too much. We can talk about that later. But this researcher who was, 
Well, it depends on you. <laughs> <laughs> This researcher said, you know, it's really interesting. When I observed the DBT supervision group, the patients tended to become best friends with their therapists but still be conflicted with everybody outside, whereas in the TFP cases, you the patients are always fighting with you, but they seem to do better in their relations outside. <laughs> so, for what it's worth. Well, at, I, I think that that highlights a really important difference because that impression is completely contrary to what the data say. Well, I mean, I showed wait, on, wait, wait, I wait, showed, wait, wait. I showed on Friday, I showed on Friday the social adjustment of patients in DBT was superior in outcome and in the follow-up period to the psychodynamic treatment. So now, it's an now, impression. Alan, I want to say two things before you go on with that. Come on, guys. No, no, because this, yeah, I think... As Science I, matters. <laughs> and looking at methodology matters. So I want to point out that, as I said on Friday, the study where Alan says the psychodynamic therapists were the control group had half psychodynamic therapists and half a whole conglomerate of other no, therapists. No, no, that's Marsha's study, not our study. Oh, well, your study is based on that uh, person nobody else in the psychodynamic world knows. So I, can't, I wouldn't generalize that to psychodynamic. No, I'm serious. No, it's true. No, so, no, if you're going to talk about research, we have to be able to look okay, at the so, research so let's, in detail. So let's put the psychodynamic aside for just a second yeah. and let's just talk look within DBT. Clinical. Within DBT, the impression that the relationship with a the therapist is very good and their patients' relationships with other people is not, is not true. That's not what the data say. That's just not what the data say. Measure it however you choose your measure. Frank, seriously, choose your... We asked the analysts in the United States to choose the measure. They chose uh, to do these observational studies of, of uh, interjected objects, which I don't even understand what that is. And we did it, and we used their methodology and their reliability, and DBT still outperformed and did very well on all psychodynamic measures of good relationships and social psychologists' measures of good relationship and clinical psychologists' measures of good relationships. So this comparative outside, DBT patients are doing really well in their relationships. Now, they also have good relationships with their therapist, that's fine. They, we don't always, but the, the, reliance, the alliance is very high. So um, science, science matters here. I think our personal heuristics, that's why we do science, is to not let our personal heuristics mess up our impressions. Well, I think science matters, but I also think science has limitations and needs to be extended. And I think... Of course. All right, so let's just... I, I'm going to move us on, okay? Yeah, How's that? You, you know, you have, you have worldwide wrestling here in... Uh... <laughs> That's right. Right. So, so I, I, was, I was thinking about it, uh, perhaps, that I was a member of the audience. And so that I, I came here wanting to learn about the various uh, effective uh, um, interventions in borderline personality disorder. And, um, and I struggle, like everyone else, uh, with uh, borderline patients. And, uh, and I'm a pretty good mentalizer, which in my mind says I do that about a third of the time, which puts me in a reasonably healthy group. Um, but if I'm sitting here trying to figure out which therapy would work for me as a, as a therapist who deals with borderline patients, what kinds of qualities pro and con um, would be beneficial for me to possess or dispossess to be successful in each one of these therapies. Uh, again, assuming that I've got reasonable mentalization and don't get dysregulated too much. What other kinds of aspects of, of my personality and character in addition to my training that might make me uh, successful or unsuccessful in each one of these techniques? That was a question. 
It is a question. <laughs> I, I think, Ken, I think in DBT, the, the two things that you noticed, um, although we would, I think, describe, use slightly different terms, are the prerequisites for being effective in DBT. I don't think there's more that's required pre-training. Having some decent self-regulation and I think if you say good mentalizing, that's fine. I mean, we would use different words, but I, I think we would agree. Those are the two things that a therapist has to bring to the process. There's a pattern developing here. Um, I think your question, Ken, gets to the root of the matter. And if I'm not mistaken, in many studies, what counts the most are therapist qualities, therapist human personal qualities more than the technique and the model they're using, which is very both nice and humbling for all of us because if you spend a lot of time working on a particular technique, you're reminded that it's about the individual in the end. But of course, your techniques and models try to help shape people to some degree. Um, the one thing I would add is that in our approach, we think it's essential that the therapist be comfortable with the depths of the human soul, that people really need to be able to deal with the intense spectrum of human emotion, as scary as it can be, as exciting as it can be, and not be put off by things. This goes against the society we live in, which tends to want us to be sort of routinized and so on and so forth. But to give you an example, uh, when I was teaching in one country and we were having dinner and, and I don't know if you all know the Fellini movie um, Satyricon, which is full of very primitive, violent, erotic, intense stuff. And one of the people who was in the training said, I, we were just talking about movies, said, have you seen that movie? I don't know what the hell was going on with that. That was the weirdest thing I ever saw in my life. I thought, not a good sign for a TFP therapist. <laughs> TFP therapists, we, that's really interesting. I was so fascinated when they started, you know, whatever was going on aggressively, sexually, or what have you. So for us, it's comfort with the most intense emotions and fantasies to be able, the ability to contain them and then to reflect on them. Yeah, I, I mean, we've got actually a little bit of data to bring to it. Um, um, Interestingly enough, we found um, in our um, last study significant differences. And this is, we, we were actually trying to do something quite original. So we, were, we took uh, 12 people who, uh, in fact, no, eight, it was it's more than that, uh, uh, it, who, 18 people who wanted to train in uh, uh, MBT, and we trained half of them, and we didn't train the other half, and we sent the uh, other half off to have training in uh, good clinical management, uh, and the uh, 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 so. Um, but we wanted to see what does MBT add to good clinical management was the, was the research question, and trying to uh, uh, a fairly rigorous answer, but we found that there were massive differences. MBT came out as accounting for some variance, uh, but actually there were massive differences between uh, the therapists. Not massive, significant, substantial differences, depending on the outcome measure that you chose. But uh, uh, the um, uh, sample is too small to, the therapy sample is too small to draw very definite conclusions, but what I can say is that what, it certainly is not inconsistent uh, with our findings, is that people who could tolerate better uh, patients uh, making uh, suicidal threats and uh, uh, self-harming uh, did a lot better in the outcome. People who panicked uh, did badly. And I think that would, I would have thought that would uh, uh, correlate with uh, everybody else's. So that accounted quite a lot for, uh, so, Anxiety, you know, it's really, it's not general effect regulation. It's uh, when another person is actually wanting to harm themselves or is doing it, not being able to retain uh, some level headedness in that setting is what uh, made a good MBT therapist. 
I think that's quite the same thing uh, that, that I was in. I think we're agreeing on this, yeah, yeah. actually, all of three of us. Um, I, I think we operation, Frank, I think that uh, the way we operationalize that is, is, is easier. So it's just we ask people if they, they like working with people with borderline conditions who have the ex who express a lot of negative emotion and suffering and sort of a, a different way of operationalizing. But we did a similar analysis that you did, Peter, and yeah. nested, you know, therapist yeah. qualities and found that, that both the, the qualities of the therapist were predictive and the technique. They both were yeah. significant and separate predictors. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So relating to the, uh, to the uh, question of the uh, personal qualities of the therapist, I would like to ask a personal question. You don't have to, uh, to answer if you don't wish to. Uh, suddenly I did changes throughout my career as a therapist. And in learning from my experience, not just... And the question is, uh, whether you can elaborate on the change that, that you have made in your career as a practitioner throughout your life, working with borderlines, I mean, and then deciding to take the decision to stick to your model. I mean, which means you, you, you've chosen to, to go with certain model. Uh, what was there that made the change? I mean, throughout your career, what, what makes you go to this specific model? Um, just that's shy. Uh, um, uh, it's um, uh, for me, and maybe I'm. Uh, that's not a, a typical psychoanalyst's uh, trait. But uh, what uh, uh, my friend, who's no longer with us, but a great friend, uh, 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 George Moran, uh, previous director of the Anna Freud Center, taught me. Um, was, uh, or uh, we discovered together, was that actually what you learned most from were your therapeutic failures. So people that you couldn't help was really what taught you most. And uh, we had something uh, that we called the Saturday Club, when George and I would meet and we would talk about cases that were abject failures. Uh, because both psychologically trained, both Anna Freudian and uh, uh, both, you know, uh, subject to uh, uh, a slightly authoritarian regime, uh, just this side of Attila the Hun. Anyway, uh, it wasn't that, but it was actually a very nice yeah, learning environment. But, you know, there, were, there was the right way and the wrong way of doing things. And uh, uh, we, were, we had to meet kind of, to, to, and we just tried to find what was it that made us fail. And one of the things that we came up with uh, in, in terms of, uh, the, we were working with uh, adolescent, uh, poorly, uh, brittle diabetic patients in the 1980s. And uh, uh, one of the things that we came up with, but actually uh, we were too complicated, that the patients lost us. They just didn't see. And that's when I kind of, with George, tried to say, well, what, what was it in the theory that we really needed to practice, what could what bricks could we take out and retain an effective therapy? How could we make it? To, and then Anthony Bateman came to this, uh, and he's a very very brilliant clinician and a very committed, uh, uh, basically a very committed. Uh, I don't think if I said that he was a socialist, he'd kill me. Uh, but he's committed to the National Health Service and he's very committed to helping the largest possible. Uh, number of people. So he said, what is it that I can train people in, in my unit, that will help people? And that's what then led us to use this uh, method, this mentalization-based treatment with borderlines, and that he evolved it, he developed it, and that's, uh, that's and then, you know, you've got, if you find something that works, you don't look back. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's an excellent question. 
And uh, I'm sure there are multiple factors. I'm thinking back to when I began to make these choices. And the first part of the choice simply had to do with when you're in training, at least speaking for myself, you find yourself working with a whole array of different kinds of patients with different kinds of pathology. And for whatever reasons, I remember in my residency group, I was the one who, without having consciously chosen to do so, got identified as the guy who was comfortable with the borderline patients. So it's something about oneself too. And it certainly didn't hurt that Otto Kernberg was on the faculty. So exposure is part of the situation too. But beyond that, it had to do, my, my interest in transference-focused psychotherapy has to do with some of the fundamental concepts about the power of the internal world over external reality. That example I gave on Friday, when the patient saw tears in my eyes and said, you're mocking me, you're making fun of me. Those experiences so convinced me of the power of internal percept internal representations to distort and, um, and modify, often in a very pathological way, the person's life experience, the affects that they experience, the behaviors that they perform, and so on and so forth, that I was, I was quite committed to a, um, this model that focused on the inner depths of the mind. But another thing that keeps me going with it is that it continues to evolve. Certainly, I don't think any of us think we've got a full understanding of how personality functions, how personality disorders work, how borderline in particular uh, is organized. And over the years, I've been working with this group and with this model. We've questioned a lot of things. Like when we published our article on interpretation a few years ago, I think we do it very differently than we used to. I think it was too far removed from the immediate situation at first. I think we've learned a couple of things, just to boil them down. One is a longer respect for the containment of affect phase. That came up in our discussion on Friday. Sometimes all you can do is sit and be a container for the affect, not judging, not reacting, not being defensive, and then gradually move out of that into a conceptualization. And there I think we share a lot of the questions that our mentalization colleagues have, how do you get someone who is, is, I was going to say deficient, let me get back to that, how do you get somebody who's lacking in this capacity under certain circumstances to develop it? It's the challenge of the day. But I did want to say, I, I wouldn't call it a deficiency because we find that people who are very high functioning in certain domains in life can totally lose the capacity to mentalize in the emotional realm and the attachment realm. So in that sense, one of the differences, if we are interested in this panel on differences, is I think we tend to focus more on intrapsychic conflict rather than just a sort of a deficit of a capacity, but that's another discussion. I, th I agree. I think this is an interesting question. It's also a hard question to answer because I think there are multiple layers. Um, at, a, at, a, at one layer, um, perhaps a bit superficial, but not for me anyway, um, uh, is that in DBT, uh, there are these, um, a synthesis of values that are important to me. Uh, it has science values and it has compassion values and tries always to integrate or synthesize those two things, and, that, and that's, um, that's important to me. Uh, so, but, so that's a, a kind of a superficial level. Um, but I agree also with what Peter said, that I think we were most challenged with our failures. Uh, and so in terms of when I might think, yeah, do I want to do something different, uh, it's only in the face of failures that, that that's, a, that's a challenge. And uh, f the science part of me says, you know, when uh, I can't make sense of and learn from my failure within my model, I need to learn a different model. Um, and I, as I said the other day, and I actually meant it, I wasn't trying, I know it's a little funny, but I actually don't believe that, that the model that we're using is correct. It's just a model. And I, I want 
always to remember that. I don't think it's real. Uh, I, I, no offense, but I don't think your models are real either. They're just models. And, and so we gravitate to models that fit our personalities, presumably, but then we have to mold those models a little bit back, and there's an ongoing, you know, iterative process there. So, you know, so far, when I've been challenged, deeply challenged with failures, my own or others in my clinic that I'm supervising, um, so far we've been able to find ways to learn from that and do something better the next time. Um, but the science part of me says also that not to stay too attached to my model because, you know, if it turns out, you know, if it turns out, you know, down the road that MBT works head and shoulders better than DBT, you know, I'm gonna line up for training, you know, I, what can I say? Um, or, or steal what it is that you're doing and pull it into DBT, one or, one or the other, you know. Um, and, and DBT does, it. by the way, DBT evolves, a lot. I mean, DBT is very different now than it was 25 years ago or more when I started learning it. I mean, it, it, it's, and it's better, I and mean, it's improved from a scientific outcome standpoint too. And I think that that's part of the process. So um, I don't know if that's an answer, but it's, 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 a, it's a short one anyway. I'm just going to briefly answer the question that was asked before. It, it was a simple case for me when I sit with a borderline patient, at least in those circumstances, I'm aware who's the healthier one in the office. When I'm with a neurotic patient, it's always uncertain to me. <laughs> So that helps me define me, and so. Um, <laughs> that's right, huh? right. It's good for borderlines. Keeps me healthy, right? Okay. <laughs> I was going to ask where uh, we ended the previous discussion, which has to do with um, we all get dysregulated to some degree. At least we may get dysregulated in our, in our minds. Uh, Frank just gave an example of it. So how do each one of you, both as individuals and as practitioners of a certain theoretical stance, deal with the dysregulation when you begin to feel it bubbling up in you? Peter says it's my turn to start. Um, uh, so I, I think the answer to that, Ken, is uh, I, I actually do exactly the same things that we would ask our patients to do in the moment. I, I use skills. Um, I use mindfulness skills and relationship mindfulness skills uh, to try to describe to myself what is what's the thing that's provoking me? What is my emotional response? How does that make sense? What's my goal? I try to sort it out in exactly the ways that I would anybody else with my patients or with my children. Uh, I do it with myself and, and I practice those things all the time. Uh, and when I find in a situation where I'm, I can't quickly re-regulate, that's something I then, I go practice quite a lot for a while until I get that down. So. Uh, there's very much a, a parallel process between the, what the process is for the therapist and what uh, we're certainly encouraging. We don't create a, a false dichotomy between ourselves as therapists and our patients. The, the, the dialectic is that we're, we're both human beings with the same psychological issues uh, and we're different. There's also, there are so differences. We don't, hopefully, as therapists, get dysregulated as often and stay dysregulated as long and do as dysfunctional things when we get dysregulated. And we sometimes get dysregulated. Well, someone better. <laughs> or an analyst would interpret the silence. <laughs> but in any case, um, I... First of all, I uh, would agree with what Alan said. And I, 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 just as an example of overlapping of the models, I find mindfulness very helpful. I try to uh, practice mindfulness to some degree. I certainly find mentalization helpful. I think, as Peter said, it's something humans have always done but should try to maximize. So beyond those, uh, the question is when I get dysregulated. Uh, first of all, 
It helps, I believe, to have had one's own therapy, to get to know one's own self as best possible. Maybe there are other ways to that route. But um, I wanted to mention that our own dysregulation is something we find an important source of information. It's not just that we're dysregulated, it's that something's happening to us that is a signal about something in the patient's internal world. Just to give you a simple example, for whatever reasons, don't ask, I was having a phone session with a patient. It was in August in Manhattan. It was very hot. I had the phone to my ear, but because I wanted a little fresh air, I opened the window and the window made a screeching sound. Not terrible, but the patient said, what happened? I said, I opened the window. And she said, how could you do that? You know how sensitive I am to sounds. You're the most horrible person in the world. You've ruined my day. You've ruined my week. You've ruined my life. And she hung up. And for the next five minutes, I was filled with the sense that I hardly deserved to live. No, seriously. I thought, how could I have done that? You know, I've just been the meanest, cruelest person in the entire face of the planet. But I sort of thought it through with whatever terminology one and I said what I tried to sort of get back to what I would consider a kind of consensual reality it was hot I opened the window people do that it made a noise that happens so it got it kind of got back to Otto Kernberg's phrase what would a normal person's reaction be in this circumstance and then I took her extreme reaction as her stuff that we needed to analyze but that she managed to deposit in me for a while which is what for lack of a better term, we call the bad object, the part of the self that's full of aggression and angry negative affect. So first of all, it's processing it oneself, but we all sometimes need a supervision group. The interpersonal processes and experience is so profound that sometimes something is stirred up in us that we can't deal with without the help of others. So we find that and I believe the other models find it invaluable to have regular supervision with colleagues. You get stuck. There's one patient I'm working with right now. I just always feel helpless, like I'm useless in relation to the case. I periodically present the case to the group. They point out things I don't see. We try to understand why I'm so filled with that particular affect, what it can help me understand about the case and feedback into the case. So our own dysregulation is both something we have to try and move beyond, but also use as an instrument to understanding. Um, I, I, don't, I don't feel brave enough to give an example of my own uh, dysregulation, but I'll give one of Anthony Bateman's. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's... Uh, uh, it's an example that he uses, uh, 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 so I'm sure he wouldn't mind me uh, talking about it. Anyway, this is one time that um, he's uh, um, waiting. Well, he, there's a patient um, who uh, uh, rings up in a terrible crisis uh, and uh, wants to uh, have an appointment and. Uh, uh, Anthony, we have a system that uh, somebody tries to uh, uh, deal with the emergency and uh, uh, it doesn't work. And Anthony, uh, through a, some kind of miraculous uh, process, finds the next step in, in our, our care plan is to have a 20 minute session uh, the next day, if possible. Um, and finds a 20 minute slot in his diary and uh, um, uh, patient uh, Julie comes in. Unfortunately, in between times, Anthony's diary is uh, used by a number of people and somebody else puts another appointment in there for that spare 20 minutes, so it's gone. Uh, and then uh, uh, he does extraordinary uh, gymnastics and finds the 20 minutes for this patient, nevertheless. Uh, so the patient comes in and Anthony says, you know, I, I'm sorry that uh, things obviously have been a bit difficult, uh, but we now have 20 minutes uh, to talk about, see, find out what it is. 20 minutes? 
God, what do you expect me to be able to do in 20 minutes? It's an insult. My life is, and you give me 20 minutes. So, so on and so on. It goes on for a while. And it just goes on like that. At, at that point, uh, Anthony gets up uh, and walks out and says on his way out, look, when you've calmed down, I'll come back. <laughs> he steps outside and he realizes this wasn't necessarily the best thing to do. <laughs> and, uh, and then we have this process of consultation as, as, as you do there, and he tries to find, we, 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 when we, our process is, our protocol is that when we've done something like that, we have to go and talk to somebody else uh, immediately. So uh, uh, he tries to find somebody in the, uh, in the, uh, in the um, outpatient area, and there's nobody, that nobody around, there's in sessions, in groups, and what have you. Then he goes into the, uh, the hospital area again, you know, the even, you know, even the uh, activity therapists are busy, everybody's busy, uh, there's nobody around. The only person who's around is a receptionist. <laughs> so he goes to the receptionist and he says, uh, uh, look, this is what's happened, you know, I, uh, the person, you know, rang out, they were in a crisis, and, uh, and then uh, and, uh, they couldn't deal with the phone, and they were found 20 minutes, and they were double booked, and uh, they, 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 said, they said, you know, they, they said 20 minutes, and then I got angry, and they stepped up. Uh, so the receptionist looks at him, Dr. Bateman, I think you should go back in. <laughs> Uh, so th that's, our, that's our protocol. <laughs> Talk to the receptionist. <laughs> but basically the bottom line is you need to, if you're dysregulated, you need to talk to another human being. Human, you know, dysregulation you will not be able to do intrapsychically. Even with, I have every faith in the power of mindfulness and the, uh, in the skills uh, that uh, DBT uh, endows its therapists with. I've, you know, self-analysis also have a deep, but I think that much more effective, and I think we're all kind of a little bit saying that, is just contact with another person uh, and, and talking it through. I, I completely agree, yeah. You don't always, can't always do that in that moment, in the middle of the session, that's all. So, uh, we don't have 20 minutes more for this discussion. We only have something like five or, or six minutes. Uh, so, my last and next question would be just for the two analysts around, sorry, because it's from the psychodynamic standpoint, which is my standpoint. Yeah. And I'd like you to refer to the role of interpretation. Pardon me? The role of interpretation oh. uh, as a vehicle to enhancing mentalizing or reflective functioning. Mm -hmm. Uh, first of all, I'm not a psychoanalyst. I work in a psychoanalytic... You didn't know that? You know. All right. I work in a psychoanalytic model, but I'm trying to be evidence that one can work within a psychoanalytic model without being an analyst. Perhaps it's, an, perhaps it's an advantage. Who knows? But I, I think you saved the good question for last because um, here we are in New York surrounding an analyst and a bunch of analysts who have been there for quite some time. Some of these people go back to the Menninger Foundation and the early studies in the 50s that are still being debated. And they all think, you know, interpretation, it's the sine qua non, it's the core, it's what we do. And then emerges a critique of interpretation from a couple of different uh, Sides. The relationists say it's an imposition of the analyst's power, which of course it can be if it's done badly. Our mentalization colleagues say it's asking the patient to do something the patient is just simply incapable of doing, so you fall into the pretend position. So we started looking at it and it seemed to us that the whole concept of interpretation had been neglected and the people all talked about it, but they didn't understand it, or if they did understand it, it was often a misunderstanding, but an interpretation is an explanation, saying this is this because that happened, and so on and so forth. So first of all, too much interpretation in our mind was historic or genetic interpretation, 
which in our experience you can do until you're blue in the face and nothing happens because usually people know that. They know their father was critical, so maybe they're very nervous about criticism for the rest of their lives. It doesn't touch on what's emotionally and affectively active in them in the moment, which is their own part that does the same thing. So the first thing we do is focus very much on the here and now. We don't say it's because your father did this. It's what's going on here? How are you experiencing me? How are you experiencing yourself? What's the evidence? Uh, what can we look at? How can we understand our shared experience? So a few years ago, we wrote a paper defining our process of interpretation, which is just that, it's a process. It's not a statement. It's a whole series of interventions, starting with a great deal of clarification, which we feel overlaps a lot with the work of mentalization therapy, trying to understand the limits of the patient's ability to verbalize what they're experiencing in the moment and how they're experiencing us. Then we add data from nonverbal. For instance, when Ruth was in the session, I was noticing her foot going a mile a minute. So I might have said, you know, something seems to be communicated here by something of your body that you're not really talking about, but I suspect we would benefit from reflecting on it. Uh, so we do a lot of clarification, sometimes uh, confrontation, which is simply pointing out two states that seem like they don't fit together and asking for the person's thoughts about what this apparent contradiction is. Um, so we find that interpretation done as a process based on a shared experience is very different from what is the type of interpretation that's been criticized so widely. And I'll just finish by saying that when we did our research, a study in New York, and then colleagues did a study in Vienna and Munich, we looked at reflective functioning at the beginning of therapy and at the end of therapy. And reflective functioning, of course, comes from Peter's model. It's the operationalized way of measuring the person's capacity to mentalize. And we found that using our method, we did get a significant increase in mentalization. So we figure, well, now I would say we can't say that's directly linked to the interpretive process because we didn't do a dismantling study, although there are, I won't go into the details, there's elements of a dismantling study. Um, but I, I would just simply end by saying, as I said earlier, we think the difficulty with mentalizing is not a trait phenomenon, it's very much state related. And I think we would both agree that one's job is to create circumstances in which the person can begin to utilize that and to reflect on what's going on. Um, just very briefly, because I know we are running short of time. Um, uh, for us, interpretation is something, uh, I would agree uh, with Frank that uh, interpretation is something is a, is a process. But we have a very simple but um, uh, fairly effective model. Um, so uh, we first of all uh, start by being, uh, when a person is in a crisis, whatever, start with being supportive and empathic in uh, DBT, my code validation or something like that. It's a very powerful. What, what, once you were supportive and empathic, then, and, and you've achieved a certain down regulation, then you are in the space where you can clarify and elaborate and challenge. And that's incredibly important that this is the process where you acquire a good idea of what the patient is thinking. And to us, I'd, rather, I'd be less concerned about genetic interpretations or, you know, or historical interpretations, much more concerned about premature interpretations. There is what you've got to demonstrate to the person that you're working with that you really, really, really understand where they are, that you've elaborated it, that you're comfortable in their world, that you've got what we call a solid platform to stand on uh, in order to actually then do what you, I think we might both call interpretation, we call uh, uh, basic mentalizing or presenting an alternative perspective, presenting a different way of seeing what they were seeing, which interpretations in effect are. 
you know, this is another way from the one that you have said that actually explains what has been happening. And that for us is always focused on emotion because as I was trying to um, say earlier, emotion is what feels real um, uh, or more real uh, to uh, patients often. And uh, um, uh, it's also something that tries to be very much in the here and now, simple, short, snappy. And once you've done that, and the patient is recovered mentalizing to a reasonable extent, then you can give interpretations that concern the relationship, that concern the mental state of one person and another person. So that, you know, kind of a two person. But this for us is, and then the way we then interpret relationship is, has, uh, again, a, uh, a hierarchy, which I don't have time to go into. But um, uh, so in a sen sentence, I would say, we use, absolutely use interpretation because, as Frank says, it enhances mentalizing massively, but we use it very cautiously and in a very titrated way, uh, not too quickly because it can then confuse. I'm sure that you do the same, you just don't write about it. <laughs> I'm sure you're right. I, I just want to say one thing with a suggestion for future conferences because it's very interesting to have the kind of role play that we saw with Peter and Ruth, uh, and one can do what one can in that limited length of time, but it's always also artificial. And I was thinking what might help most at this point, which we don't have time for or we're not set up for, is if we came, or people representing different models came, with sort of, uh, you know, sessions we could, real sessions that we could show on video. We couldn't show the real ones because of confidentiality, but we've now, for didactic purposes, reenacted certain sessions that really happened with an actress who's very convincing. Because there's one moment I just wanted to make reference to before finishing my remarks. I was able to show this with the Israeli Association for Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy the other day. But it has to do with the splitting that you said I'm a splitter, and I am, but I'm also anti-splitting. But in any case, um, the patient was being very angry and hostile and kind of devaluing of me. But in my counter-transference, I sensed the kind of a warmth. So in our terminology, that would be her being in touch with one side of her split internal world and me being in touch with another. And we were try I was trying to figure out why she was in this intensely negative state at the moment. And she was saying, it's nothing to understand. You're just a lousy therapist. This negative state is just a representation of reality. And the interpretation wasn't anything more than to say, I wonder if this is what happens when you begin to get attached to someone. Because it seemed to me that what I was feeling that she was not letting herself feel, but yet reacting to, was an increasing attachment that made her anxious. And when I said that, I wonder if, the, if this was not saying anything of an explanatory nature, it's just suggesting another part of the self to be aware of. And long story short, once she sort of could reflect on that, it began to allow us to put things together. So I think interpretation isn't an explanation. It's just bringing the person one step beyond their current awareness and you build on that. So before I thank the, before I thank the panel, I, I want to thank the audience. At least I spoke yesterday and I'm sitting up here today and uh, you're all very attentive it's hard to see you, but there's not much stirring going on, and you respond very well. So, and I know for all of us up here that, that we can sense that. There, there's a, 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 a mentalizing impact that's going on. So, so we feel that, and it allows us, I think, to, to focus. So I, I, I'm sure other people will say it, but you're a great audience, you really are. And I want to thank the panel, and So uh, we, now we've got a 45 minutes break, lunch break, and we resume at uh, quarter to two. Thank you.